commemorate and raise awareness. And raise awareness, we are having a panel discussion in Q and A about a panel discussion in Q and A about human rights. Today, you will be hearing from different activists and their experience with human rights. As well, this meeting will be recorded and posted on the oral later. To introduce this topic, we're going to be sending out some Zoom polls. Click on the option you think you relate to the most. Number one, have you ever felt singled out because of your race, religion, culture, or physical abilities? Two, have you ever felt that you were denied an opportunity just because of your racial identity? And three, what are you doing right now to advocate for human rights? Okay, so when answering the polls, you may have noticed that the main topic is discrimination. And that is why we have these amazing speakers here today to talk to us about their experiences. Before we introduce the speakers, we ask that you all please mute your microphones and turn off your cameras. If you have any questions during the speeches, please send them in the chat and at the end there will be time for the speakers to answer them. First we have Alicia Aslam. At 16 years old, Alicia had been featured by CBC, The Globe and Mail, The Toronto Star, and National Observer towards her advocacy for positive social change with youth. Her words have impacted many around the world as she participates in numerous councils and groups that support change. From being in her board's student senate to a page at the Assembly of Ontario, she has drafted policies for the youth of Ontario, collaborated with the US Consul General in Toronto, written for UNICEF, provides STEM opportunities to marginalized groups and continues to write articles to empower youth to persevere despite hardships. She believes everyone has been discriminated against in the past in some shape, way or form and carries a version of her story. However, she encourages everyone to make a change and become their own activist. Her goal is to bring unity into the community and build a world where youth are not only able to survive, but are able to thrive. Amazing, thank you so much uh, for the warm welcome. Um, I actually have a few slides, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna share them really quickly. All right, so can you see my screen? Yep. 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so like I said, I'm uh, super, super thankful to be here and super honored to be here. So thank you so much for inviting me. Um, my name is Alicia. I am in grade 11. I go to school here in Toronto. Um, and yeah, so I'm in my second semester of grade 11 in high school. And um, even though I have been in school my entire life, I've always loved doing things with it. So I've always loved doing extracurriculars, um, or something in the community or just really anything to get the word out about youth voice and to represent uh, youth voice. So I really believe that the world doesn't just run on its laws. Um, I think laws help govern the world, but I think that the world really runs on its citizens, each and every one of its citizens. So that's why I'm so excited to be here because clearly, um, because you're here, you really care about what happens to these citizens and you really care about the advocacy that's going on in the world right now. Um, I'm sure you all know about what positive comments look like and what hate comments look like. And that also comes as part of the job when you're being an activist um, on important issues is that as the more public you get and the more you get out there, there's always going to be a lot of, um, a lot of hate comments, quite frankly. And I think that that's super important to mention as well, is that everybody who's here and everybody who's advocating, it takes a real strong amount of resilience um, to, be, to be able to do that. And I'll talk about that more about what I've done um, later. So, but I really think that everybody is an activist for any sort of issue. And that can really be at any age, um, wherever you go to school, wherever you live, um, however old you are. But yeah, like I said, I think that um, everybody counts as an activist, no matter on what level you are. Um, advocating for issues is always super, super important. And I think that there's a lot of qualities that we have that we carry along um, to be about it. And so when I get into my advocacy, my goal with my advocacy is to make sure that youth aren't only heard, but they're accounted for in these systems and governmental systems, because the future is ours, but we also have the power to change that. And we also have the power to make our voices heard in the process. So like was said in my introduction, I think everybody has a version of each other's story. And, you know, we all may be discriminated, but no one is impaired from making a change. And that's why we're here. So we can use all that power to make that change. Um, everybody is considered different in one way or another, but a lot of families have been considered too different, um, like that devastating attack on that London family and like a lot of people who face discrimination on a daily basis. And that's why I want to bring the unity in community. So first of all, um, what I would say is to get involved. So when I talk about my story, it might be different from yours, but the one similarity that it's going to have is that it's important to get involved, um, whether that's with your library, whether that's with your school. I'll talk more about how I um, got involved at an early age uh, later on, but it's just important to start thinking about where you think that you can fit in, whether that's with a sports team or a music council um, or an ensemble at, at a concert, or maybe you're into theater, but even if it doesn't have anything related to directly um, related to human rights, I think it's important to nonetheless get involved and get your name out there and just start talking to people and make connections because that's what really brings you um, far. And when you advocate for stuff like this, it really builds resilience as well because now you have an entire support system to help you throughout all your advocacy. So just to start off, um, just to give you a review of kind of my story, I guess, um, I mentioned that ever since the beginning, I've always loved being in councils and loved um, representing students, whether that was like in grade one for just a little task or um, what I do now. And I think that that's really shaped me because you, we can talk about, you know, what I've done or what I want to do, but it's really important to remember where you come from and where your interests lie. So ever since the beginning, I loved speaking and I loved writing. That was my main thing, especially in during the pandemic where we couldn't exactly meet at events. I started writing more and I started writing articles um, a lot more. And that's really what got me uh, I guess more out there um, when I decided that I wanted to get them published and I wanted to make more people read them. But I loved uh, speaking as well. I think that that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, just talk. I love, um, I was one of those people that just love talking to other people. And um, in 2018, I served on the Toronto District School Board Student Senate. So that's a group that um, strives to make the voices of the TDSB students heard and their concerns heard so their changes can get put into the system, as well as currently I'm uh I volunteer with the FBLA, which is Future Business Leaders of America. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know about this in high school. It's a great organization that promotes um, 
entrepreneurship and everything among students, as well as um, I was a page at the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, which if you'd like to know more about that, I'd love to tell you all. It's an amazing program. And I got to learn about how the government works and how youth fit into that, which relates to human rights, because uh, a lot of these systems actually take place through government. And so that's why it's really important to learn about that. And yesterday, I just finished another program with them, um, which was called the High School Model Parliament. And our bill got passed, which is amazing. I'd love to talk about that if you want to hear about that more. But that's just another one of my experiences. Um, I've also, you know, sat with UNESCO um, with the Center of Young Women's Empowerment, where we empowered uh, women all across the globe to bring more women into politics because women are uh, heavily underrepresented in politics and I feel like we need to bring more of that in. So as you can see, human rights doesn't have to be about a specific issue or about just one issue all the time. It can be about a lot of different issues that you're passionate about. Um, for me, I always have a hard time deciding um, and I love to be like, you know, covering all areas. So that's what's really important to me, talking about a lot of different issues um, at the same time with a lot of different um, aspects of it, I guess. And recently, I was also in the Ontario Provincial Youth Council, where cabinet, sorry, and um, we drafted policy. So I drafted one for Francophone relations to um, ensure students who wanted bilingual learning could get that in the province, and also with youth employment, because we know that a lot of youth are unemployed, we're looking for jobs, so it's really important that they get the resources that they need, um, as well as the first ever world policy thon. Again, that relates to government more, because as you go more into human rights, you start getting into the governmental aspect of it, I guess. And that was with a lot of universities and everything, which was amazing too. But the one thing that I think brought um, all these experiences together was really the community. And that's what's in the middle right there, is that without community, you can't really get all of these opportunities. And what I mean by that is after each one of these events where we um, you know, are angry or frustrated over something that's happening, change is promised. But that change doesn't lie in your hands, it lies in your voice. And that's really important to remember because I think that a lot of times we think that, you know, the stuff is just going to happen. But if you're not going to take that extra step, nobody else will. So it's really important to start getting out there and take that extra step, um, get involved from a young age, like I said. And it's so important because that is what helps bring the unity and community and bring that adaptability too. Because a lot of times, you know, especially as a student, I'm all over the place. I'm going to school. I'm, you know, going to all different things. But having a team and creating that sense of community to do all these things, that is what's really important, um, in my opinion. And uh, more about what I've done, I guess, more specifically, is that after I, you know, was in all those councils and everything, I still am in a lot of them. But um, after that devastating attack that happened um, in London, the Islamophobic attack, I created a resource called Change Starts in the Classroom for the TDSB. And it was all about educating um, the schools and students and teachers and whatnot on Islamophobia and what we can do to help stop that. I also wrote op-eds on that in um, the Toronto Star and a lot of different other publications. Um, I wrote this blog, The Obvious Secret, on the UNICEF's page. And um, it's about activism in general, honestly. It's not really about a specific issue, but I think it gives a really good insight on human rights and what you can do to stop it, um, as well as the Globe and Mail, like I mentioned. And um, the thing that I think is really important to remember is as everybody was answering the poll questions too, was that there were a lot of challenges. Um, even when I tried to get this resource out, it was actually not passed by my school. And I was very, very devastated that that did not happen um, because I thought, you know, like we're, something bad happened and this is kind of just you know this daily discrimination has to stop because it clearly was continuing and that's why I brought it to the board and I brought it to my trustee and thankfully she uh, decided to share that and I share that with the um, equity forum and with a lot of other forums that I think was super important to do so if you'd like to find out more about my work or more about what I've done you can go to the link below that's also in my Instagram which I will uh, share at the end but that is probably what I update the most um, if you want to read any of those, because I think that um, I'm always open to hearing from people and sharing my work. So if you'd ever like to read that, that's always there. So more about how you can get involved. Um, like I said, I think everybody has different journeys, especially being in high school. I see everybody, um, you know, from different middle schools, different elementary schools, different areas. And we're only going to get more, I guess, diverse as we go on. But I think the one important thing is that human rights are universal, you know, no matter what end of the earth you're on, no matter where you're working, where you're learning, human rights are universal. And a lot of people often confuse that with politics, which, and I've shared this with a lot of people, is that 
you know, politics and human rights are not the same. Politics is something that we can disagree on, we can debate on that, but human rights are something that we need people at the forefront working towards because unfortunately, not everybody has access to those. And human rights, like in the name, they're a right. And we need to make sure that everybody gets those, which is why the advocacy for this is so important and so broad is that we need more people focusing on that because this is something that should not have any debate. We all need to focus on this and we all need to get everybody as many human rights as they deserve. So um, how can you get involved is, if you like speaking, I would say pick up uh, public speaking. I know that I tried to do that and I still continue to do that um, in school or wherever you go at a community center uh, that may be anywhere as well as school. So school I think was like one of the biggest uh, factors that impacted me personally because I was there every single day and I use that to my advantage. I, I love doing academics and everything but I also really, really love speaking and doing you know the STEM club and the female empowerment club and you know the leadership council there so i would say get involved in your school first um also at the library that was also one of my founding i guess uh bases was i went to the library a lot and i joined their youth advisory group and was a page there and helped out with their um youth campaigns to get uh teens to read which was super interesting and ask questions i know that there's you know that question mark that's there because it's important to ask questions especially when you're starting out you don't know uh, how you should go about something or how you should start or anything like that. And that's why I think that um, it's super important to keep asking questions because we won't know everything and that's okay. Um, as well as writing. So for me, writing was really big. Speaking was too, but I loved getting my thoughts on paper and, you know, on my notes app on my phone, I'd go off about a lot of things. And recently I decided to, you know, have people hear about them. That does come with its downsides and obviously you don't have to get it published, but writing really helps get your thoughts out. Um, another thing that I also really think is really interesting is about how I know a lot of you may be on Instagram and Instagram is such a helpful tool to get the word out. And social media is a really helpful tool to get the word out as well. However, a lot of the times uh, it's used for performative activism. And this has been something that's been talked about a lot in the past, but um, a lot of times everybody holds their Instagram accounts accountable for reposting something when we can also, we should also be holding ourselves accountable for, re, for um, change in general. And what that means is that oftentimes people's advocacy goes down with their Instagram story after 24 hours. And that's not what we want. Um, you know, performative activism, it's great at, you know, raising awareness of issues. Like reposting is great at raising awareness of something. And that's a great first step to creating change. But the rest of that ladder and all those other steps are things like this, coming to meetings, talking to people, talking about problems, solutions. That's the real raw activism that we need. Um, we obviously need, you know, stuff online, but we really need raw activism right now. And I think that, especially with online, that gets phased out a lot. But we have to remember that um, we need to hold ourselves accountable rather than just our Instagram accounts accountable. And that is super important to keep in mind, especially because a lot of my, a lot of what I share is online. So sometimes it's hard to, you know, differentiate the two, but I think it's really important to kind of keep that line and keep doing things like how this wonderful organization is doing. Um, Cause I think that stuff like that is super important as well as, you know, politics has an end, but human rights has been here ever since we've walked the earth. It's something that, humans need and we need people advocating for this, which is why I congratulate each of you to even coming here, because that is a great first step to even learning about human rights and learning about what you can do to solve and to fit into the narrative, um, how to help solve it. And so in conclusion, I really think that everybody really has the power to, um, you know, give everybody else human rights and to fight for what they believe in. And it's all about how you use it. So whether you use it at school, whether you use it at home, however you use it, it's really important that you know how to use it and you know how to communicate because that's what really sets you apart from the rest. And like I said earlier, the change doesn't lie in your hands, it lies in your voice. So um, with all these experiences that I've had, I know yours will definitely be different and that's okay because a lot of times um, I did find myself kind of comparing to other people and saying, I didn't do the same thing as them. Am I going to, is mine going to be, my advocacy going to be as effective or not? But it's super important to know that with all the speakers, everybody here, our lines and our paths are going to be different. And that's what makes each and every one of us special and, you know, specialized to fit to a specific group or fit to a specific audience. And I think that's the really big thing that's important to remember. Um, my Instagram is here at the bottom because that is what I use the most. I also have LinkedIn and stuff, but I do 
not, I'm going to be honest, I do not use it that much. So I think um, if you want to follow me along on my journey, it's down there. I would also love to follow everybody along on their journey um, because I just love discovering more about human rights and more about what we can do to help um, give everybody else the resources that they need, whether it be in STEM or whether it be in sports or anything like that. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um, thank you so much for letting me come out and speak to everybody. Um, oh yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen, but that's pretty much it. And I love um, asking questions and hearing questions from everybody else. So feel free to ask that at the end. But like I said, thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing from everybody else. Thank you, Alicia. <clears throat> Remember, if you have questions, send them in the general chat. And if you would like to stay anonymous, send them to Mikhail. Continuing on the thought of daily discrimination and youth speaking out about their experiences, we have Mariam Jahim. Mariam Jahim is a 16-year-old left-hand below elbow amputee, and she was featured on CBC regarding her first experience facing disability discrimination from the Ministry of Transportation when attempting to get her driver's license earlier this summer. Her experience has awoken and sparked conversation on the lack of education regarding people with a disability. She believes that the resources regarding disabilities are severely lacking and must be improved. She's devoted much of her time to creating positive change wherever she can regarding problems with amputees and disabilities in general. Mariam Jahim believes that much of the ignorance in the treatment of people with disabilities comes from a place of misinformation, and she tries to educate people on the correct information wherever she gets a chance. Thank you for that. Uh, hi everyone, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Um, Can you share it? Yeah, there we go. Sorry, it's... There we go. Can you guys see it? Yep. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Miriam Jahim. And today I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about my experience with discrimination against people with disabilities, where I'm a left hand below the elbow amputee myself. Um, without any further ado, let's get started. So I'm just going to talk to you guys a little bit about me. I am a 16 year old Muslim Iraqi Canadian living here in Toronto. I'm in grade 11 and some things that I love are sunsets, sunrises, coffee, spending time with friends and family, um, learning new things and spending time in the great outdoors. Uh, growing up, I've always taken pride in my amputation. Uh, as you can see here, I've done many presentations ever since I was in daycare. Um, so yeah. Um, Mariam, there's, yeah. do you want to try showing your screen again? I don't know why there's like some gray for part of it. Really? Oh, oh there you go. That might be, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, uh, that should be good. All oh. right, okay. Wait, it's back. Let's try. that does that work yep that's good all right so i'm just gonna dive into my story so like any other teenager um on my 16th birthday june 14th uh of this year um i was headed to the drive test center in new market in excitement to get my driver's license Little did I know, I was going to be discriminated against and turned away due to my disability. Before going into the center, I looked at the Ontario website and the Drive to Center website to ensure that I have all the required documents. I entered the center and filled out the required paperwork and completed all the required procedures that are usually done before you do the written test. And after I handed the form to the employee there, she saw that I had filled out that I have a left hand below the elbow amputation. As soon as she saw that, she took the form, went to her supervisor, later telling me that I can't take my G1. Um, 
I was told to fill out a medical report form, which would be sent to the medical board, which is under the Ministry of Transportation, and that I would have to wait to hear back within two weeks. I followed her instructions, filled out the form while seeing all the other teenagers walk into the test room to get their G1 license with ease. And I went home and waited for over a month and heard nothing back. I then called, the we were contacting the Ministry of Transportation and I was told that in no way I should have been denied um, my privilege to take the written test. I also reached out to other amputees with the same disability as mine or something similar. Um, and they were able to take their G1 test without any hurdles. Um, some did have to take like a physical, do a physical assessment, uh, which is understandable. Uh, regardless, I decided to go back to the center to further understand what had happened with my application. I spoke to one of the employees and she opened my file and told me that I would be able to take uh, my test, but she wanted to go double check with her supervisor. Although I was behind the counter, I was able to see that there was a lot of deliberation and confusion among the staff. And then she came back and told me that they had done nothing wrong and that I needed to contact the medical department. I did exactly just that right after I walked out of the center and the medical department told me that I should have been able to complete my G1 and I will hear back from them within 24 hours. Heard nothing back. After not hearing anything back, I contacted CBC News and told them my story and I was looking for some sort of hope. CBC News contacted me back, we set up an interview, and the day before the interview aired, I received something in the mail from the Ministry of Transportation. It was a form that I, that form I had been waiting for for months, and I needed to get that filled out by my doctor, which would have to be sent back to the Ministry of Transportation, and then they would decide whether or not I could take my license. My CBC uh, news segment aired and it started conversations regarding ableism and people started asking me questions and how can they get involved and how can they help? And um, it really brought uh, this, like, this problem to um, sh shine some light onto this problem. Um, and then on August 24th, 2021, I finally was able to write my G1 test and I passed. Um, it, we worked with the war amps to send out a letter back to the Ministry of Transportation um, on how they could better the system and prevent this from happening to another person. Because honestly, I just feel like there was a lack of education behind um, dealing with people with a disability um, because when I, every time I walked into the center trying to get my G1 uh, and trying to understand what's going on, I found that there was a lot of confusion and they didn't really know, um, not what they were doing as per se, but there was no clear procedures for the workers to follow. And I asked one of the workers one time when I was in there, um, I asked, do you guys have any clear steps, any, like a specific procedure to follow? She admitted and she said, no, like they go off of their gut feeling or whatever. Um, and I just wanted to talk about how my experience and how it infringes on my human rights. So what happened to me um, was, so basically driving is technically a privilege. It's not my right. But um, because of the, the way that I was dealt with, I was discriminated against because of my disability. Um, as in section five of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, I have the right to equality. And um, that section, is, uh, it's intended to ensure that everyone is treated with the same respect, dignity and consideration without discrimination, uh, regardless of personal characteristics such as race, uh, nationality, uh, color, religion, sex, age, or mental or physical disability sexual orientation, residency, marital status, or citizenship. And I took this right out of the um, of Canada's website. And this was clearly infringed upon um, in the incident that happened with me. So I just wanted to talk about how us youth can advocate for human rights and get involved. 
So these are three ways that I find uh, you can help uh, advocate for the rights of people with a disability. I honestly believe that educating yourself is key. So you kind of need to know like what are the right terms, uh, who to go to, uh, the different types of disabilities, mental, physical, um, and how to respectfully speak to someone with a disability. And then that leads into getting involved, uh, volunteering and getting to know more people with a variety of different disabilities. Um, and I honestly believe that educating yourself and getting involved in the disability community is what will give you more insight on how you can help and it'll make you want to help. Um, and another way you guys, that us youth can help is speaking up. Uh, so submissions and lobbying gov the government to make changes that promote and protect the, uh, protect the rights of people with a disability. Um, campaigning for social change by speaking to the media to raise awareness and highlight situations where people with a disability are treated unfairly. And lastly, um, using the hashtag and ableism, uh, I find that this hashtag, um, it's really helped to bring awareness and it kind of helps to connect the disability community and just clicking on that hashtag and seeing all the stories, um, it also gives you a lot more insight. Uh, where you can volunteer, I just wanted to add this in. Um, one uh, place that I think it, it, it gives you an amazing opportunity to really find out more and connect more with the disability community uh, is through Holland Floorview, which is a kids rehabilitation hospital. And there are many, many other organizations and places that you can help out, um, but this is just one of them. And who to go to um, if you find that, if you or someone you know has had their um, rights, uh, rights uh, being, being uh, had to, uh, them being taken against their human rights. And one of them is the CCD, uh, the Council of Canadians with Disabilities. Um, CCD is a national human rights organization of people with disabilities working for an inclusive and accessible Canada. The Council of Canadians with Disabilities is a social justice organization of people with all disabil disabilities that champions the voices of people with disabilities, advocating and inclusive and accessible Canada, where people with disabilities have full realization of their human rights as described in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And last but not least, the youth are the future. And I just wanted to conclude with that. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. There we go. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much for sharing, Miriam. So finally, we have Libin Muhammad. Libin Muhammad graduated from Ryerson University 16, where she completed a bachelor's degree in their four-year child and youth care program. She is currently pursuing a one-year project management certificate at Sheridan College while serving as the program manager at YTJ Studio 89. She's a social justice advocate who is devoted to youth work, which tackles discrimination, promotes inclusivity, and teaches empathy. YTGA, which is an abbreviation for Youth Troopers for, youth troopers for Global Awareness, is a youth-led nonprofit organization that mobilizes and empowers young people for social justice through arts, best advocate for animals, humans, and the planet. Studio 89, its partner organization, is a community hub and cafe in Mississauga, offering empowerment and entrepreneurship opportunities to those who face barriers to employment, and a free space for grassroots organizations. Libin. Amazing, thank you guys so much. Um, first and foremost, I wanna say, this is so cool to be a part of. I'm really honored to be able to speak, especially amongst so much youth that are so inspiring. Um, I might be a little bit older, but I do feel like very, I would say, happy that like you guys are like you guys are the next generation you guys are the change makers so it's really cool to see that all happening here and for you guys to all come together on a Sunday in terms of human rights advocacy that's super cool so thank you so much for the intro um sounds like a lot but I'm gonna go briefly just to who I am again 
So I've just been with Youth Troop of Global Awareness for the last three years. I joined them originally in November of 2018. Um, I'm currently 27 years old. So you guys heard about what YTJ is, but I want to go deep into the origins because it's really cool to hear why our nonprofit came to be. So in case you haven't heard of Youth Troop of Global Awareness, it originally started with a group of high school students actually in John Fraser Secondary School in Mississauga. So this nonprofit, essentially they were in a classroom and they were having some conversation based on clean water in communities around the world, as well as human trafficking. And from those conversation, it allowed those youth to come together with their love for the arts to start making theatrical productions about human trafficking. So it got super popular amongst Mississauga. And then that's how we decided to get our own location so they can house all the theatrical productions and other programming that they can come together to create. So that is how Studio 89 came to be from YTGA. So we've been in Mississauga for the last quite a bit. We started actually opening our doors in 2014, and now we have a new location if you guys would ever like to visit, but we can talk about that later. I'm gonna talk more about um, my own experiences with human rights, as well as like what you guys can do to be more active in your communities. But it already sounds like you guys are, so I'm just gonna add on to it if anything. So. I was thinking about how I should angle like the way that I'm gonna approach this um, speech. So I was first thinking, oh, maybe I should talk about my own experiences, but the core of everything that I do comes with empathy. So that comes with advocating beside people in terms of helping to eradicate discrimination and prejudice. So I kind of want to go more into the reason why I decided to go into program management and to become a more social justice advocate. So I think my first instance of social justice has to come with the first time that I heard that my family members were called the N-word. So that unfortunately came when I was pretty young. I think I was around the age of five. So I don't necessarily understood the origins of the word at the time, but I saw the impact that it had on my family members. So if you're a visible minority, I'm sure that you might have a similar experiences because you may have been exposed to behaviors and attitudes and thoughts that hurt you or the people around you. So unfortunately, this is a truth that we have in our world. So we have to just learn how to overcome it as best as we can. So that was the first instance in which I got into social justice. But the main reason as to why I decided to professionally embark on social justice actually happened when I was in grade eight. So I don't know if you guys remember a certain show, this might be a bit funny, but there was a show called Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Does anyone have any memory of that show? Okay, I see some nods, okay. So in grade eight, I was actually at home watching an episode of that show, and there was an episode specifically about the Aikless family. So it aired in October of 2005, which kind of shows my age, unfortunately, or actually 2008. And essentially these two young people, Brooke and Faith, they were the daughters of the family and they were wheelchair bound because they had muscular spinal astrophy. So unfortunately their house was not accessible for them. So they were such a wonderful family in the community that their community actually pitched them for the show so that they can have the house structure more accessible for them and their family. So that kind of story just completely moved me. And that is essentially what made me wanna help people in my professional life and to embark on human rights as an older person. So going into that, this is where I am today, three years into it. And just, I believe in achieving equality and equity is so important as somebody of course that doesn't face all the barriers or all the discriminatory um, actions around the world. I just believe that everyone has the power to make a change, whether that is on a small scale with the community, but in turn, all steps towards justice helps make an impact at the very end across the world. So essentially with that story, I know that I wanted to specifically tackle a few things in my professional work. Like for example, I wanna live in a world where accessibility isn't an additional feature to a space that it's already built into a space once it's created. And I also wanna live in a world where children and youth who are minorities like you and I don't have to experience an upbringing that's tainted with hate, injustice, and closed doors towards opportunity. So now I'm working for a nonprofit, of course, that is completely geared towards empowering youth for social justice through the arts. And it's just an honor, essentially, to provide marginal communities or marginalized communities 
with a platform and the resources they need in order to make a change. So yeah, the world is constantly changing and we should definitely change with it so that nobody is left behind. So there's three ways that I would like to talk about how youth can get active, but I'm sure you guys know, I'm kind of just gonna build off of what Miriam and Alicia said very expertly. Um, so the three ways I would say was number one, get educated. So when you're confronted with a social justice issue, you may not have all the knowledge about it. So we're likely living in an age where information is at our fingertips. So I do recommend looking it up, but only checking academic and verified sources because one of the most valuable lessons that I learned in my teenage years so far away was that not all of us are born knowing everything. I know it's hard, especially in the age of social media um, and cancellations with young people, but not everyone has all the answers, including myself, even though I do work in social justice advocacy. So the first things first is that you definitely have to go forward with just trying to better yourself as you go on. So you should figure, forgive yourself for your ignorance while also, also actively working toward getting educated, especially again, as we live in an internet age. And of course, the adults in your life, whether that be your parents, your uncles and your aunts, they might not know everything either. So of course, it's all our independent duty to try to seek out that knowledge. Um, the second thing I have here is also building on Miriam's point is volunteering. So not be biased, because I also do volunteer for Nation at Suite 89, but Volunteering as a young person is especially very important because that's when you get to be on the front lines of seeing all the gaps in service within like Mississauga, Toronto, all over Canada. So being on the front line helps with expanding your knowledge, building your tactical skill set, as well as making the difference as best as you can. And also it can lead you into a career into being a social justice advocate if that's what you want to do. So this is something actually I'm going to tell you guys some intel as like an older person. Volunteering experience is as important as job experience. Don't let anyone betray that with you or not say anything. But like genuinely, as a person who's 27 now, who's out of school or at least out of like high school, um, that experience is super valuable. So especially if you can tie it into your advocacy and get that experience of being on the front lines, that's super valuable in not only expanding your real set, but also just having that. Um, on your back end. So last but not least, sharing knowledge. So a lot of the most moving messages or lessons that I've ever learned in my life came from my friends and family. So knowledge set, um, sharing, especially when it comes to correcting problematic behaviors, but only if it's done in a safe and responsible manner, um, can help with everything because nobody has the same unique set of challenges as you do. So it's important to be able to share your story, whether that be like through social media, through Instagram, through your school councils, through any art groups that you have, your story is important. And who knows, you might inspire somebody that was like me, young me in grade eight who watched Extreme Home, Home Extreme Makeover Home Edition, that's a really mouthful um, in terms of going professionally into social justice advocacy. So I believe in all of you. You guys all have the power for change. As Miriam said, you guys are all change makers. You guys are the future. So please use your power and wield it well. And just remember, you should definitely forgive yourself. You're all just learning. You're all just getting out into the world. But you all have the power to make that change that will be valuable for everyone. So yeah, that's just my little talk. And thank you guys for so much for listening. Um, of course, if you guys want to just chat with me, if you want any advice about like how to go professionally into more advocacy roles or even just program coordination and program management, I am available on LinkedIn. You can search up Libin Mohammed. I'm the program manager again at YTJ Studio 89, and I'm more than happy to assist. And also you can find Studio 89 at studio89.org. And we do have Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with Studio 3089. So thank you guys. Thank you so much. You all did amazing. That was really inspirational. So time is, now it's time for our Q&A. So we ask that you guys send any of your questions in the general chat. And if you'd like to remain anonymous, please send them to Mikhail and he'll read them out loud for you. Mikhail, you can start. Yeah. Um, okay. First question is for Alicia. Um, a lot of people are confused where to start to be an activist. How did you start? Definitely, yeah, thank you. Um, I think, first of all, uh, it depends based on everybody's experiences. 
Um, so for me, the why I started was because I felt really discriminated against, um, especially because I was like the only Muslim in my class and the only Muslim in a lot of rooms. And that's why I felt like I really wanted to do something about it. So the first step to starting is to kind of have a reason or something to look back at when you want to know um, why you did it, because things will get hard and they do get hard and you do feel defeated um, a lot of the time, especially with a lot of hate going around these days. But I think that's still important to remember why you're starting. And for me, how I started was, I would say, you know, ever since I was in school, I just loved taking on extra responsibilities. I know that that sounds really like, oh, you know, like everybody does that. And that's true. A lot of people do do that, but it really does help. A lot of people don't realize how important it is to do that, um, if, especially with volunteering. I went to the library a lot. Um, you don't, you know, you don't just get to the top of the ladder just it, like on one day. Um, it takes time. So I really, really liked whenever I got the chance, I loved speaking. Um, I loved doing speech competitions at school. I love going to the library, as well as the page program that I did was early on in grade seven. So that kind of also tied into that was like my first exposure to how government, um, you know, goes about and how it works. And also writing. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you publish it or not. That's a great start, too. So you can, you know, write in your notebook about how you feel about different issues. And, you know, you can share it with people that you care about who you want um input from and who you want guidance from so i think that really starting from the base is important and whether that it, that could be about anything you like like joining music ensembles i was in like every single one in my middle school just because i loved it so much and uh sports teams and you know like stem clubs so start from there start from where you are and take all the responsibility that you can take all the um, power that you can to do the most you can in those and that's how you're going to get up from there All right, thank you. Um, our next question is for uh, Miriam. How did you find the courage to speak up for what happened to you? I definitely would say um, it was my mom who really, and my, my family and my friends who really supported me throughout all this. But um, the first day when I came back, from the drive to test center, I was devastated. Um, I was in bed. I, on my birthday, like I was done. I, I, what, I felt hurt. Um, and that night I was like, no, that's it. That's it. No, I need to stand up because this is not okay. And what happened to me should not happen to anyone else. So the next day, um, my mom and I, we started thinking of ideas and seeing how we can um how we can get things moving um we waited a, we said let's wait for a little bit waited a month nothing was coming um I was fed up I knew that this was taking from my time as like you have like you have um because I wanted to get my driver's license as soon as I could um and yeah then one night my sister and I sat down, we, we wrote out an email to CBC News and things just started moving. Thank you. Um, our next question is for Libin. How did you create the idea of Studio 89? No worries. So just to clarify, I personally did not create the idea of Studio 89. I'm just a small part of the organization. So actually going back to my story so the group of high school students that were from John Fraser secondary school they were the people who created YouTube with World Awareness so before we were like a physical entity with Studio 89 it was a small youth group who essentially did theatrical productions about issues their most popular being about human trafficking so actually one of the founding members her name is Zara is still with the organization she's our board president so I do report to her and we're still keeping the vision alive from the original group through her so I'm just a small part of the organization. It's way bigger than myself. But yeah, so Studio 89 became a product of YTGA and now I'm just a part of the whole cycle to make more programming for the community. Thank you. Um, next question is for the whole panel. Um, what do you think is the difference between an activist versus a protester? Is there a need for both? Um, Alicia, you can start us off. Sure, yeah. Um, I think I have more, like, I mean, experience or more eyes on the activist part, just because I myself uh, do that more. Um, 
but I definitely have seen, you know, protests in the media, like the pictures that are taken from there. Um, so I think, I mean, I feel like a protester is also a type of activist, um, like in the poll question, protesting was a form of activism. Like, how do you fight for human rights? Some people do that through writing. Some people do that through this. Some people attend rallies and protests with like, you know, their signs and flags and whatnot. Um, so I feel like there's definitely similarities. I th think there's more similarities and differences between the two, um, just because I feel like activist is more broad and then protesting is like a form of doing that activism. Um, and is there a need for both? I think, well, sure like i don't think that there's anything that would you know stop an activist from being an activist or stop somebody from um you know going out into the street and fighting for what they believe in and standing with a lot of people i think that both of those definitely have different contexts like activists you know you can do that online too but protests are more they take place in person and they're important too because people operate in different ways and people feel safe in different ways so i would say um I think in a sense there is a need for both because I think a lot of times online activists are ignored as I've seen. I think that a lot of times collective movements where a lot of people come together like the BLM movements where there were a lot of people who were standing up for the right thing for what they believed in. I Thankfully, they um, people started getting more empowered to speak out about that issue because they saw, hey, so-and-so is act, uh, advocating for it. Maybe I should go with them and, you know, create a sign or two. So I think that definitely both of them have a very strong impact on human rights. Thank you. Um, Miriam? Yeah, um, I completely agree with everything that Alicia said, um, but I definitely think it's important that uh, we're not only leaning towards one side, we're not only protesting, um, it's, it's essential. I find that protesting in such big causes such as BLM or uh, free Palestine, those are those like the protests we saw had a great impact. Um, but I think it's important. Not only are we are we doing one thing, we should try to do multiple things at the same time. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Livin. So the tough thing about being last is that you guys have said literally all my thoughts. So I'm just going to keep it super brief. So I totally agree. So in terms of activism, the way that I define it personally is just somebody who generally um, pushes toward political and social change, whereas like protester, like Alicia said, is like more of like the active physical act of going out and doing more rallies and et cetera, protesting against something so they can make more change. And just talking about like why they need both. I do believe, like, again, what we said about Free Palestine and Black Lives Matter, like, personally with Black Lives Matter, I know that really made an impact on me, just because, like, for example, the unjust killings that are happening towards Black people, it's, of course, very personal. So to see everyone coming together, not only in Canada, but, like, across the world for those rallies, I knew that was very, like, emotional. In that sense, it kind of shows that there is unity and there is people who are also worried about the situation at hand. And it shows that just people care and there's empathy going around. So I feel like, no, nothing can change or nothing can happen unless everyone comes together. So that was really like an example um, and kind of insight of like what we can do together to make positive change. So yeah, I definitely think there's a need for both. Um, yeah, that's all where I stop it up right there. Thank you. Um, our next question is for Alicia. How did you get involved in the work at the Ontario Parliament and what do you suggest for other Muslim youth to get involved in politics? Yeah, I, I like that question, the last part of that question, um, just because I felt like I could never be represented in Parliament. Um, I feel like already there are not that many Muslim leaders out there, um, just because it's just so hard to get noticed as a Muslim. I, like even when I was in elementary school, I heard so many comments that I don't even want to repeat just because I would go home devastated, not knowing what to do, um, you know, being scared about my own identity and about how I fit in with everybody else. And that continued until high school and that even in a way, it even got worse when I started doing activism because that becomes more public and as, like all of a sudden everybody knows you're Muslim and everybody, you know, thinks that it's a lot of people think that, you know, that that's something to be scared of or be ashamed of. So I think that the way that I really started was um, I'm somebody who's constantly on the look for opportunity. Like I am, I just love getting involved. Like I said, I love um, 
always being on the lookout. So I found out about the program happening with the um, the page program, first of all. So I applied for that. Um, I got in. And again, a lot of the things that helped me get in was because I was already involved from like elementary school and middle school. And specifically um, with the Ontario Provincial Youth Cabinet, I also heard that there was a calling for like writing representatives to um, help brief policies and everything. So that really made me um, more empowered to do that. And um, after I did that, you know, drafting the policies and everything, that took a really long time. And, but I'd say that to specifically for Muslim youth to get involved, I'd say um, if you hear no once, like that is normal. I heard no a lot of times from people just because of my religion, unfortunately. And I would just tell them that to keep on going. I know it's hard. It's definitely hard. And that's why you have a whole support system here ready to support you. But I would say that, um, you know, like if you feel discriminated against, if you feel like, you know, you're the only person who's feeling all this, trust me, we've all we've all felt it and we're all here to support you. And for Muslim youth and for youth in general, I would say the important thing is just to not let anybody tell you what you can or can't do and to not let anybody tell you what your limitations are, physical or mental. That's for you to decide and your identity is for you to decide. So I would say make sure that you take control of your own narrative and let your actions speak for themselves. Uh, thank you so much. Um, next question is for uh, Livin. Can you tell us more about YGTA and how we can support this organization, either through volunteer or donation? No worries, an excellent question. So in terms of YTDA, so that is of course our nonprofit organization. So that's the nonprofit organization that's behind Studio 89, which is our social enterprise. So Studio 89 is like our physical entity. It's the vegan fair trade cafe, and it's the way that we generate revenue for our programs in addition to grant funding that we do. So everything that we do is through YTGA. So in terms of how you can like get involved in terms of volunteering, so we just, just moved into a new location in Mississauga. It's on Eglinton Avenue West, and it's right across the street from Credit Valley Hospital and Aaron Mills Town Center. Um, I don't know if you guys know that. So just like in case you guys are Mississauga and Toronto, but um, I'm more than happy to give the address. But yeah, so that is our location. And we are right now looking into doing more volunteering opportunities. So in the past, we did have volunteers that wanted to do more social media work. So that helped us promote our programming on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And then we also had people who are called our youth social justice team. So that kind of carries a torch from our original YouTube Global Awareness Group, which is a bunch of youth that came together for programming and theatrical productions. So this group actually was responsible for their own event planning. So what I would do is that I would support the group. They would meet before the pandemic, of course, at Seed 89 every Saturday for one hour. And they would essentially think about any social justice programming that they would like to conquer. And then I would support them in making that happen. So some of the past things we've done is that we did some like nights to talk about indigenous culture and the way that we can support indigenous communities in Canada. We've done some like school assistance with the University of Toronto. Um, we've done an abundance of things. So essentially what I do, of course, is just go through the scheduling, but everything is done by the youth social justice team. So that's another way you can get involved. And then also if you just, just wanna generally like help out with the maintenance of our space, we do have customer service opportunities as well as research opportunities for our programming. Like for example, we will be having a podcast that's coming out soon that revolves directly about human trafficking. So we had some youth who would help out on the research end of that. So yeah, there's a bunch of opportunities. And if you would like to volunteer on our website, we do have a volunteer form on cd89.org. I can post it in the chat afterwards. Um, but in terms of donations as well, if you would like to donate, we also have a donate page on our website, cd9.org. And we appreciate everything, whether it be volunteering or donations, whatever works for you guys. So thank you so much. I'm happy for your interest. It's very sweet. All right. Um, our last question for uh, the event is for Miriam. Um, what emotions did you feel during your experience and how did you not let them affect you? Um, in the beginning, my emotions, I would say, is what fueled me. Um, the first, obviously, in the beginning, um, when I went in and I was signing that form, uh, the medical report form that I was given, um, I remember looking to the right and seeing the teenagers just walk into the room, um, ready to take their G1. Uh, um, and I remember tears started coming to my eyes because I kind of felt hurt. Like, what am I, what did I do wrong? What's wrong with me? 
um, those were kind of the thoughts that I was that started coming into my mind. Um, and I was like, I, this was the first time I ever experienced something, um, some sort of discrimination because of my disability. Uh, you know, as a Muslim, as a hijabi, like I have experienced discrimination, but I haven't usually let that affect me. But this was the first time because, and it honestly shattered my confidence that I'd built up for 16 years. Um, it kind of shook that. Uh, and it, and I find that I took that day to kind of, you know, calm down, settle down. And then um, I slowly was able to um, collect, gather my emotions um, and let that fuel me. Be like, I don't want to, I don't want anyone to feel what I felt that day. I don't want that to happen to anyone. I let that fuel me in order to get to a point where I'm speaking out and raising awareness about this um, problem um, because ableism, it exists and not a lot of people know about it and there's not enough awareness about it, not enough education about it, not a lot of people know about it. So um, I let that day, that those emotions from that day um, kind of fuel me. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, one last question for everyone. Um, who are your mentors in activism? Um, Alicia, you can start it off. Of course, yeah. Um, I think as far as mentors go, um, there's a lot of people who I look up to that are, you know, people that I don't talk to, like famous people um, that I always look up to um, in terms of how they speak and how they communicate. But I think in terms of mentors, like people who I meet with who have helped me a lot, um, I mean, a support system would be my friends because even when I was advocating um, against Islamophobia and everything, and there was a lot of hate that I was getting for it. I had the, those friends as that support system. Um, I think a lot of other mentors would be teachers. They also helped me um, get a lot of like, you know, even if it was like a reference or anything like that, get uh, the word out about, you know, activism and just to get into a lot of programs. They were definitely helping me with that in school and outside of school. Um, and I think also family is a really big thing too. Um, for a lot of people that differentiates depending on who you are but I think like especially for me um, my mom helped me a lot especially after like that rejection from the school passing on that resource because just because of who I was just because of continued discrimination so I think that that she, she was really a mentor and I feel like all those mentors helped in different ways but they all help different parts of that activism to kind of help you um, stay afloat and stay positive throughout the entire journey. Uh, great response. Um, Miriam? Yeah, so as Alicia said, uh, friends and family um, and anyone around me, really, uh, younger or older, um, something that I find I found myself doing growing up is taking, is, I've looked at the people around me, specifically like my mom. Um, she, I've learned a lot of things from her. I've learned a lot of things from my friends. Um, when it comes to um, have, like experiencing discrimination or someone saying no uh, and not taking no for an answer and continuing to stand up uh, for your rights. Um, and that, and um, yeah, I just say my support system um, has really inspired me. And I, I'd, also, I, I'd also say, uh, the war amps, the people at the war amps. Um, I don't know if many of you know about them. The war amps child amputee program. They um, are they are there for all for amputees all over Canada, and they're a nonprofit organization. And I've grown up with them. You know, seminar. They have they hold seminars and they uh, fund uh, our prosthetic limbs. And they help really with connecting you with other amputees. So something that really helped was talking to other amputees, the older and the younger, and seeing um, that not only am I experiencing this type of discrimination, but um, all, they are as well. And it's important to stop that. And it's important to fix that and to talk about it and raise awareness about it. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Livin? 
Nice. So to build off, I also believe like the people around you, your families and friends can make the biggest impact on you. Um, but in terms of what Alicia said as well, like there are certain celebrities that really make an impact on me on how they can just on a wide scale combat discrimination. Like for example, one of the most influential people or influential people I've ever had in my life, or I mean, from like a celebrity fan site, um, I would say it's Halima Aiden, who actually happened to be one of the most like popular like Somali models because of course like I didn't think that was possible for somebody who looked like me and came from my same culture so seeing that all the things that she had to go through to become such a high fashion model and the strides she made for everybody that really inspired me in terms of not being too afraid to tackle things that I want to do and do more engagements like public speaking for example and just putting myself out there in general so she's really inspired me um there's also just like different types of artists that inspire me like i know bts does of how they come back as like a south korean group um but also again like the people in my life specifically who mentored me which is zara who i talked about earlier the originator of ytga she's absolutely fantastic she's literally been doing this since 2006 so since she was in um, high school to where she is now. I think she's the coolest person. And I hope you guys, like, if you ever decide to join us for volunteering, I hope you do get to meet her because she's very inspiring. Um, as well as someone named Ilyas. So Ilyas was very influential in terms of getting myself out there. He's the one who gave me the privilege to even talk about my story as a Black Muslim woman and to get there out for public speaking. He's actually one of the reasons why I'm here today, um, literally for this event. So I do have a lot of things to give him. But of course, it's just the people that really pump you up and uplift you and support you when you need somebody that really make all the difference and make you who you are. So I give all those people um, attributes to my confidence and who I am today. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you to everyone for sending in their questions and for being so engaged during this important conversation. To conclude, we want to thank all of the wonderful speakers for sharing their experience and wisdom with us, the members of the Oil Youth Committee, and all of you for attending and being such a great audience. We all need to do our part as citizens and encourage participation to stand up for, to stand up against discrimination and fight for human rights. Thank you and have a lovely rest of your day.